Welcome to Christ Church Online. We have really enjoyed getting together uh, to pull together these worship services for you. We enjoy the thought of worshiping with our family. Even though our family is spread out, uh, we are still one church. We're still part of uh, the large church, and we're still part of Christ Church. So thank you for worshiping with us. Thank you for your faithfulness each week. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the opportunity to worship. We thank you for the tools that you have given us so that we can join together even though we're far apart. Father, we pray this morning that you would be with us as we worship, as we read your word, as we consider who you are. Pray that you would enlarge our hearts and call us into a deeper walk with you. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Son not sparing, send him to die. I scarce can take it in that on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. He shall come, and when Christ shall come, with shout of acclamation to reign on earth what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God how great thou art then sings my soul from Revelation 5, where John records this vision that Christ gave him when he restores all things. It starts in verse 13 and goes through 14. It says, Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. 
and the elders fell down and worshiped. Because you see, when we experience our lamb, our savior, we have no choice but to worship him. And as we meditate on his return today, let's just fix our eyes on him and worship him together. Let's continue in song. to imagine what it will be like when every knee bows and every tongue confesses that he is Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you will cry these bones will see
strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross, my worth is not in skill or souls are only satisfied in you. You are our treasure. You are the one that we long for. And we long for you, Jesus. We long for you to come. We love you, God. Forgive us for when we try to fill our lives with other things. Refocus our minds, refocus our hearts, tune our hearts to sing your praise, Lord. God, as we open your word together as your body, would you change our hearts? Would you transform us into the image of your son? And God, would you bring us closer and closer to your heart? Father, you are faithful to us. Thank you for faithfully walking with us every day. And thank you for the hope we have because of the gospel. It's in Christ's name we pray all these things. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Katie. Cindy and I have a friend, and she is a voracious reader. Matter of fact, sometimes she reads three or four books a week. And we're not talking about the kind of books you and I read. She reads really huge books. And I remember several years ago, I challenged her to read the Bible through. She had never read it. And she read through the entire Bible in about a week. And probably worked through a couple of Russian novels uh, as well. 
And I was real anxious to hear what she thought about the Bible. And so she kind of grinned and she was kind of pausing. She kind of baked me on just a little bit. And I said, well, what did you think? She said, it's a really good book. And then this huge grin came across her face and she said, did he write anything else? Uh, not only does she know how to read books, she knows how to push buttons. And I think that's all she does. I think she pushes buttons and, and reads books. And the interesting thing, though, about the way that she reads, she'll never read a novel or read a book until she's read the last few pages first. She won't get mostly involved in the story unless she knows where the story is going. And, and I'm kind of a traditional reader. I like, you know, reading from the beginning, and I like watching the plot unfold and feeling it, you know, kind of take the twists and turns along the way. But, but she is right. If a story falls apart at the end, it's almost as if the entire book was not worthwhile at all. The Bible is, is a story where it's good to know the end. It's good for us to know where the story is going because when we know where the story is going, we know how to read the rest of the story. And not only do we know how to read the rest of the story, we know where we fit in in the story and how we live the story. So uh, the hope that we have is shaped by the way that Christ brings everything to conclusion in the new heavens and the new earth. So we've kind of extended our Easter series. We started by talking about the life of Christ and then the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. Last week we talked about the exaltation of Christ, and after it was over, we said we may as well talk about the return of Christ, because the return of Christ shapes who we are as a people. And once you're aware of the theme, uh, you'll read it in almost every corner of the New Testament, the expectation and the hope that we have when Christ returns. So I'm going to take you to a passage uh, that is... Uh, We've read it three or four times in this series because it's such a bridge passage. And it's a passage that you know, builds a bridge between Christ's life and his death, between his death and the resurrection, between the resurrection and his ascension and exaltation. And finally, it sets the expectation for his return. So if you have your Bibles, why don't you join with me in Acts chapter 1. And I'm just going to read a big chunk of this, beginning in verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Christ began to teach and to do until the day that he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles that he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized you with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Uh, then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Of course, this is one of the most important passages we could look at when we think of the seven, second coming. And he said to them, it's not for you to know the time or the dates. The Father is set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. They were looking intently into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand there looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you've seen him go into heaven. And of course, that's the expectation we have, that one day we will see him return, and we'll see him bodily return. And although he'll return in the same way, you, you get a hint from Scripture that the glory that we see in will be even more grand than the glory you know, the disciples saw. You, you can see how this begins to shape the way that they, they preach. A few days later, when the Holy Spirit did come, Peter and all of the apostles and the disciples were in Solomon's porch, and they began to preach, and they began to proclaim, and they began to speak in other languages, and people were hearing the marvelous deeds of God. And as the crowd gathers, Peter preaches his first sermon, and as he brings the sermon to the conclusion, and I'm just in the very next chapter, Acts chapter 2, verse 32, he, he reminds us once again of Christ's return. He said, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we're all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and he has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. 
Therefore, let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And Peter does, as the New Testament writers will do again and again, he goes back to Psalm 110, where David is speaking and he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. And of course, that is one of the big emphasis in Christ's second coming. At his coming, he will vanquish all of his enemies. Just in the very next chapter, Peter and John are walking into the temple to pray. And as they're walking into the temple to pray, there's a, a lame beggar who's begging beside the temple gate. And as he's begging, Peter and John look at him and they have great compassion on him, but they don't have any money. And they tell him, we, we don't have silver and gold, but what we do have, we, we'd love to give you in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and, and walk. And all of a sudden, he's walking, and he's leaping, and he's praising God. And people have seen him for years. And so they began to gather, and as they began to gather, Peter again tells them about the exalted Lord. And this is one of my favorite passages in all the book of Acts. As he brings the message to conclusion in Acts chapter 3, beginning in verse 19, he says, Repent then and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through the prophets. If part of Christ's second coming is that he vanquishes all of his enemies, another huge part of Christ's second coming is that he will restore everything. He'll put things back the way they were before we broke them. Matter of fact, he'll put things back even better than they were before we broke them. So God is not simply redeeming us. He's redeeming all of creation, and we can expect that at his coming. Several chapters in, you have the Apostle Paul. He wanders into the city of Athens. When he wanders into the city of Athens, he notices all the tributes to all of the gods throughout the city. There's a statue to this God and a statue to that God. And finally, there's a statue to the unknown God. And he uses that as a place to talk about the one true God. And he tells them, I can see that you are a very religious people, but you worship a God you don't know. Let me tell you about the God you don't know. And as he comes to the end of this message, after quoting, you know, after quoting their philosophers and quoting you know, some of their prophets and some of their poets, he brings his message to conclusion like this. He said, therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man that he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. And so those are the big three themes that you see. Christ, you know, is, is, is coming in order to vanquish his enemies. Christ is coming in order to restore all of creation and, and to renew us in his presence. And this is the hard one, you know, for us. Christ is also coming as judge. So finally, when he comes, we will know him as Savior or, or we will know him as judge. That's why in the Old Testament, when it looks forward to the day of the Lord, it talks about the great and the terrible day of the Lord. Be great in so many ways, but there are so many heart-wrenching uh, things to think about as we, we think about judgment. And we always have to think about the fact that, that uh, all the world will be judged and all the world will be made right in hell. So we're going to take some of these passages and we're going to you know, take you through the New Testament and then draw a couple of conclusions at the end. Uh, and we're just going to look at how you know, the New Testament authors bring in this theme time and time again of Christ coming. There are two places where you know, uh, Paul describes his second coming in detail. 1 Corinthians you know, chapter 15, he described it in, in beautiful detail. And then in both of the books, you know, that he writes to the Thessalonian church. And the Thessalonian church felt like you know, some of their friends were going to miss out because they had already passed away and they didn't get to see the Lord coming. And, and Paul writes to them in order to reassure them that we will all see him come. 
And, and so Matthew's going to kind of take us through those passages. And he knows how he used his name, Matthew, the formal <laughs> name, uh, when he reads formal passages. So go ahead, Matthew. Yes. First Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul um, is writing to the church in Thessalonica, as Paul said. And one of the interesting things about this church is they're fascinated about the second coming of Jesus. And you see it. Um, it, Paul mentions it in every chapter of First Thessalonians. He's alluding to or mentioning um, this second coming of Jesus, but he's writing to them to encourage them, you know, concerning the second coming of Jesus in relation to those who um, who have gone yeah. before, who are who are now asleep, um, as Paul would say. So, First First Thessalonians chapter four, verse thirteen, Paul writes, "Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about these who sleep in death." so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the, wor the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Yeah, I love what, what Paul does is he's writing to them and they're wondering, what about all the saints who have, who have passed? Or will they miss out on the benefits that we will have when Christ comes back? And what does Paul do? He says, no way. There, there's no chance they're missing out. In fact, they're going to rise first. They're going to have more fun than you are. Yeah, they're, they're going to be a part of uh, the imagery that he uses, I love that he uses this imagery. It's associated, these words for, for coming and, and meeting with the Lord are, are words that would have been used in a kind of a procession of a dignitary. If a, a dignitary or, or maybe a king was coming into a city, everyone would go out to meet the king and then to proceed, you know, to bring him in and throw a big party and a loud shouts and here is royalty coming in. And what Paul does is say, just in case you're thinking they're going to miss out on anything, the second coming of, G of Jesus is going to be a marvelous scene, you know, and they're going to be a part of it. They're going to be part of the, pro the procession that leads, you know, him in. And, and you just get this imagery, I think, from Paul that, that is encouraging for us that I think a lot of times we can think of the second coming and, and wonder about dates and times and, and maybe even view it as this fearful moment of only judgment. And Paul is actually saying, you're wondering about the dead now. I could just tell you where the dead are now, but instead I'm going to tell you to look forward I'm going to tell you to think about the second coming oh, yeah. of Jesus. And, and, and their, you know, in their struggles and in their tribulation and their persecution and the hearts of Jesus facing. So think about that. Yeah. You know, think about the day that you see him face to face. Think about the day that, that all of those that you're so concerned about now will, will rise and you will see them face to face. Think about the day that you'll all receive him, you know, in glorified bodies and you're right. That's such a beautiful image. It's the image of a conquering hero coming back in the city and the entire city floods out, you know, to meet him and then to escort him back into the city, you know, for the celebration. Yeah. Ha same thing happened to Paul, you know, after the shipwrecks and everything on the way to Rome and he finally is a bedraggled, you know, traveler finding his way into the city of Rome. So he goes to this little place they call the Three Taverns. I thought that was kind of interesting outside of the city of Rome. And all the church comes to meet him at the three taverns. And obviously they weren't coming there because there were three taverns. They're coming there because Paul was at the three taverns, not all three of them. But anyway, <laughs> they come and they meet him as a prisoner, as if he were a dignitary. And, and they escort him back into the city and celebrate, uh, you know, the gospel, you know, of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and you have the beauty of this image is Paul is grounding all of this in the fact that that Christ has died and been resurrected and been exalted. And, and so you have him even at the beginning saying, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be un uninformed. So, so we do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. We have a great, a great hope and we grieve with hope. And, he's, and the reason we have this hope is we believe Jesus died and rose again and we believe that he will come again. The second coming of Jesus is good news for us. Um, and, and I love how he concludes it. You know, he says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. Yeah. So the second coming of Jesus then means that we have a, a great gospel to encourage one another in and to remind one another of. It, it's not we stand outside and, and what are the dates? What are the times? Oh, man, what's going to happen? It's let's which, encourage which one millennial another. position? How many people are going to be in the tribulation? Uh, 
Would, and those yeah. are great things to talk about. Yeah, no, those, but, those are fine. <laughs> those are fine. But sometimes we get so caught up yeah. in the detail, we, we miss the central message that he's coming, that he is restoring all things. And what a joy it will be for us to see him in, in all of his glory and to yeah. experience his glory along yeah, with him. Yeah, and we can't miss, right? The, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's the incredible promise of the gospel is that Jesus has secured for us everything, you know, that, that we, we need, um, this, this longing for relationship finally yeah. and fully forever. How can a sinful, God, or a sinful man and a holy God be made right again? We will be with our God forever because of Jesus. He's coming back to get us. Um, and so th- these are encouraging words um, from Paul, and it looks like they still don't quite understand fully, no. right, this second coming. I mean, we, we don't either, but we have another letter from Paul um, to the church in Thessalonica. And so Second Thessalonians, if you're reading along with us in chapter 1, um, he, again, he's going to, to talk about the second coming of Jesus. And so Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5, he begins, All this is evidence that God's judgment is right. And as a result, you'll be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you have believed our testimony to you. You know, this is probably the more difficult side yeah. of, of the second coming of Jesus. We've, we talked about this some this week that we tend to think of the second coming of Jesus and, and we, we can't wait. Maybe we, the sight of him coming and thinking, man, I'm going to be with my Savior. But the, the other side that I think maybe shocks our Western sensibilities, yeah. in a sense, is this idea of judgment or this idea of, of justice. And I remember Tim Keller um, talking on this at one time, and he said that if, if we are offended by the fact that God you know, comes as a judge and he, he delivers justice, well, on the other side of that, in the, maybe on the eastern side of the world, they would look at this and say, well, how could you believe in a God who forgives? And that would shock them. The idea that God would, would be a judge or, or you know, yeah. execute justice, that came easily for them. They would say, I, I can understand that. Yeah, but a God who forgives. But for us, we read a passage like this, and, and judgment and justice are a little, a little more difficult for us. <laughs> yeah, no, there, there's no doubt. I believe, you know, whenever you first, you know, came... Uh, you know, to Cedar Park, you introduced me to uh, Jim Hamilton's, you know, biblical theology. And the title of the biblical theology is, you know, kind of a bit jarring, you know, God's glory in salvation and judgment. And God is glorified both in his mercy, extending, you know, the gift of the cross, you know, to all who would receive it. And he is also glorified in, in, in setting right everything that is wrong and everything that is set up against him and everything that is destructive and everything, you know, that is unholy. And, and it might, you know, help us a little bit, you know, that this is hard, but it might help us to know that it also offends, you know, God's sensibilities. And he said, you know, through the prophet Jeremiah, said, do, 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 do I take any delight? You know, in the destruction of the wicked, would I not... Far rather that you return to me and, and, and live. And, and of course, you know, that's what, you know, Jesus and of quotes Isaiah when he comes in the city. He says, all day long, I've held up my hands to an obstinate and to a stubborn people. So that there is, you know, there is, you know, there is that part that, that God will vanquish his enemies and he, he, he will judge those who have stubbornly, you know, re- resisted his grace. He offers mercy, you know, to everyone, you know, who would freely who would freely receive it. Yeah. And you, you also have the vindication of God's people in this text. You have kind of a, a great reversal. You know, as yeah. he's writing to the Thessalonian church, they're, they're undergoing an intense persecution. And I, I would imagine that probably some of those in the previous letter who have passed away, who have died, died because of persecution. And, and they're now enduring yeah, this persecution absolutely. as Paul's writing to them and encouraging them through the second coming. He, he says, you're going to be vindicated right now. It is, you know, it is God's judgment is right. 
And so why, for whatever reason that God is allowing them to go through the suffering they're going through, what Paul is reminding them of is that it won't be forever. Those who are suffering now will then be relieved, and those who are the ones causing the suffering will undergo suffering. Yeah. There's this great reversal that will happen because of the second coming. And they're not experiencing the soft persecution that we experienced. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if people thinking we're a little bit silly or maybe a little bit foolish. Uh, they're, they're actually being persecuted physically. They're, they're being beaten. They're being you know, thrown in jail. Their livelihood is being taken away from them. And, and so they're, they're, they're suffering. And, and, and Paul has encouraged them, when you suffer, you know, not to retaliate, but to leave that in the hands of God. And he's saying in this moment, when we do leave it in the hands of God, he knows how to turn the tables and set all things right. Uh, part of what he is coming is to, to set the world right. And that's every injustice will be healed. And every pain and every sorrow will be healed. And of course, even those who suffer the soft persecution of, oh, you guys are just so silly, and will be vindicated because there will be nothing more glorious than you know what we have believed and who our Savior is. And what a comfort to know that it's not our responsibility to get revenge, you know, for the things that are done to us or to um, other believers, but that we have a just God who, who will judge rightly. Um, and that takes that responsibility off of us and it, and it allows us to be a people of grace and a people that points to um, the forgiveness that has been offered to us in Christ. And as we face um, sufferings, even if it's not that intense persecution um, that, that they were facing, I think we find comfort in um, Philippians 3.20 20 and 21. It says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. And as, as I read... I'm just the context of this, um, the whole letter, and then just this um, chapter. I was just really, um, what stood out to me is just that there were people who were finding all their confidence in their flesh. And even Paul goes on and talks about how if anybody has, has um, the ability to be confident in his flesh, it's him, you know, and he lists all of the, his resume out. Um, but then he says, I mean, I, all of this is garbage compared yeah. to knowing Christ. And so... Um, and the thing is, our confidence isn't in our flesh. Our confidence is found in Christ, and he is sitting on the throne. I mean, he is in heaven, and that's where our citizenship lies. Our citizenship isn't here right now. It's, it's with him in heaven, and so we, we look forward to that day that we will finally be where we belong, yeah. which is with him. Uh, we're, we're living meaningfully in this world. Right, right. Uh, but we are also living for another world. Yeah, such a tension. Uh, yeah. Right? Like uh, looking forward to that time and that moment with him and spending eternity with him, but also not, you know, still living here meaningfully, like you said, like living now and, and wanting to serve um, those around us and, and share the gospel with them. Too. And, and of course, the theme we just talked about, the theme of judgment deeply motivates that. Yeah. You know, if we have a heart, you know, for those around us, then, then, then that heart, you know, comes through, you know, in introducing them to the gospel and living out the gospel in front of them. And of course, that's part of why even when we're being persecuted that we live with grace mm -hmm. because we want them to see the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and his mercy. Absolutely. And I think just as a, as a stay-at-home mom, I, um, I find comfort in this, and I really kind of have to remind myself over and over that this is not my home. Like, this, I, I get to look forward to... It's a pretty nice home, though. <laughs> right. I am thankful for the home that yeah. he, he's given us here, but, man, I, there are moments where we're just like, ah, this doesn't feel quite right, and it's yeah. because I look forward to um, that day where I get to be in his presence, you know, where my citizenship lies. Yeah, as much as we try to get comfortable in this, you know, world with, you know, all the cool things that we put around us and things like that, uh, we should never quite be comfortable here because we, we weren't made for this. Uh, we were made, you know, made for another, made for another world. And to add to that, while these are meaningful lives that we can enjoy, 
We also know that we live in weak and broken and yeah. um, very yeah, dishonorable bodies now, but we can one day look forward to um, a glorified body and uh, living in heaven with our Savior. So John wrote in 1 John 3, 1 through 3, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that Christ, when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves as he is pure. I love that, that it is the great love that the Father has lavished yeah. on us. It was um, costly and extravagant, but it was the gift of his son that ena enabled us to currently now become children of God. But to think that one day um, these weak and broken and uh, very disheartening bodies will one yeah. day be glorified when we see him face to face. Um, I love that and that we will exchange these bodies for a body, which blows my mind, for a body that will live for all eternity, um, praising our Heavenly Father and, and living with Christ. Yeah. So it's kind of cool. You know, can you imagine, you know, for us, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's, uh, you know that, that, that's an incredible hope, you know, because, uh, you know, uh, yeah, our bodies are, you know, not what they used to be, not what they could be. You know, nothing like the magazine pictures, you know, that we have subscriptions to or anything like that. Uh, but, but can you think what that would be like for Crystal? Mm -hmm. You know, who's been confined to a wheelchair for all of, all, all of those years. And, uh, you know, who deeply loves the Lord and deeply loves his worship. And, uh, you know, to see all of us, you know, all of us restored and, into that glory. And, and I do, that. this is, you know, I was talking about earlier, you know, how Acts... Three is you know just such a favorite of mine. Repent then and turn to the Lord. The time of refreshing may come from the Lord. Uh, this this is an incredible verse. We've already received a lavish love. I mean, I mean you know th this world is a a blessing because of the lavish love that we've received. And John says, I I really have no idea what is, what we're going to be like, but I do know that when He appears, we will be like Him. And evidently, the catalyst for change is this. When he appears, we will be like him because we'll see him as he is. And when we see him in all of his glory, and of course, this is the way the passage you read a while ago, and it said, he will transfer our lowly bodies into his glorious body, which is kind of crazy to think. When he appears in glory, we'll be transformed to be like him. And the, the catalyst for that change will just be we'll see him as he is. And I always you know, felt like the more we see him as he is now, the more we become like him and the more we want to come like him and the more we long, you know, we long for him to come. These are, you know, fantastic you know, verses. Peter also, you know, kind of pulls in uh, the, the second coming in, in his letters, which shouldn't surprise you. He's already done it in the sermons that he you know, preached in the book of Acts. In First Peter 1, um, beginning in verse 3, it says, praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and his great mercy. He has given us new birth into a living hope, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all of this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, You've had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Christ Jesus is revealed. And, and that's what we're talking about while I got to, you know, to, we can't quite get comfortable here because uh, this is not what we were made for. And, and there will be hardship and there will be testing. We're, we're living, you know, through a national hardship now. And it's been incredibly hard on, you know, some of our brothers and sisters, you know, well beyond, you know, what, it, what it's cost us, you know, as we walk together. And so there, there are many experiencing hardship now, but Christ is even in those. And, and he is in those proving, you know, the genuineness of, of, of your faith, uh, you know, the testing of your faith, proving the genuineness of, of your faith, so that your faith becomes even richer, even more uh, compelling to you, so that when you see him, 
all the more glory because of the hardship you've been through, you know, now as a part of that. So, you know, James captures, you know, one of the things that we should be doing. We're going to talk about what we should be doing until he comes in a little more detail. But James captures part of it beautifully. He just says, be patient then, brothers and sisters, until our Lord comes. There's a lot that will happen between now and then, a lot of it glorious, a lot of it tough. But all of it, we have the hope of Christ and it. So let me just kind of you know, sweep through real quick and just give you, you know, five quick things, you know, that we've, we've just talked about to, you know, summarize this. You know, what, what can we expect when Christ comes? First thing we can expect is, is to see him in his glory and experience his glory with him. Uh, I loved even in the judgment passage, you know, where he ended, all of this will happen on the day when he is revealed in his glory and marveled upon uh, by all those who believe. Uh, you know, Christ, when he was praying uh, before going to the cross, you know, John 17, he said, Father, I've brought you glory here on earth by completing the work you've given me to do. Now glorify me with the glory I shared with you before the foundation of the world. And I want them, uh, speaking of us, to be with me so that they may share in my glory. So we'll see something that is just absolutely beyond our comprehension. Uh, we will see him in his glory and we will share in his glory. A, a second thing we, we can you know, expect is to be transformed into his likeness. That, that's already you know, kind of happened. You know, Paul talks about in Colossians, we have put on Christ and because we have put on Christ, uh, we are being created, uh, recreated in his image uh, to be like Christ. And, and so we, we've had the first part of that, but it's going to be absolutely complete uh, with, with none of the old, you know, fleshly things that you were talking about, you know, from, from Philippians. Then another thing is says we will see all enemies vanquished. Every pretension that sets itself up against God, everything that has opposed God's people, you know, especially the principalities and the powers. And, and, and of course, the promise in Genesis uh, was that, you know, uh, the serpent would continue to strike a blow to the seed of the woman, but the seed of the woman would crush his head, and the enemies are finally vanquished. And, of course, the last enemy Paul tells us is Satan will be crushed. That's right. Death will be crushed. And death will be crushed. And sorrow and pain will be crushed. And then, as Matt said a while ago, we will be vindicated. Uh, the confidence we've been placed in Christ uh, will we'll be so rich and, and, and so deep that, that we have no shame, no regret, uh, that we will rejoice you know, with Him and, and with each other. And then finally, you know, we will enjoy him in a renewed creation. Uh, we are being renewed. We will be renewed. Uh, but uh, he is restoring all things. And, and we talked about, you know, when we started this, knowing the end of the story. So let me just read, you know, one section of the end of the story. Uh, this is Revelation, you know, 21, you know, 1 through uh, 5. Um, then John says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. It was all the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride. And, of course, we already know from the New Testament that the, the, the bride is not, not, not a building, but the bride is a people. And, and we as a church are that, are that bride, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look. God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I'm making everything new. What a great day to look forward to. Yeah. You know, and... I mean, just processing all this and thinking about the Lord's coming and, you know, Katie's tearing up over here next to me. I mean, what what an incredible day to look forward to. This is what I think spurred the church, you know, for is, is you have James saying, be patient, the Lord, and he tells him, be patient again, right after, you know, verse 9, because the Lord's coming soon. Yeah. You know, they, they had this great anticipation that the Lord would come soon, 
And, and for us, even today, um, Randy and I were talking earlier just about, you know, will the Lord come in our lifetime? Man, I don't know. I know the Lord's coming soon. But what a day that this is to look forward to, that he will come, uh, he will reign, everything will be made right. He will judge the world in righteousness, for his yeah. judgment is right. And, and we will be with him. Yeah. Uh, there, there's, uh, we, we, you know, we started by saying that this is the end of the story. But not quite true. Uh, this is the beginning of a whole new story. Mm-hmm. And it's a story where we will be with our God forever. Uh, you know, that's what he created Eden to be, a place where we could enjoy fellowship with him and the beauty of his creation and marvel in him and know him. And, and we'll do that forever. And I know a lot of people, you know, have this kind of thought, you know, heaven's going to be really boring. <laughs> you know, they're just going to do, sit on clouds and play harps and do hymns. And nothing could be, you know, nothing could be further from the truth. We will finally fully be alive. And we will finally fully uh, know our God, and we will finally fully, you know, enjoy the beauty of creation and unadulterated, you know, fellowship with Him. And so, what a, what a beautiful thought. So, how should we live until He returns? Let's just give you, you know, let's just give you four real quick. First, we ought, we ought to live with a sense of expectancy. Don't, you know, get lulled into the everyday routine without, you know, lifting your eyes and thinking about the future and living your life in light of the future. You know, whether, whether he comes in our lifetime or not, we, we will one day see him. And this is just a mist. I, I mean, these, these long, hard, arduous years, you know, that we pound out here are, are just a mist, you know, compared to eternity. You know, like the, the hymn writer, you know, said, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright, shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we just be gone. And, and uh, 10,000 years is just... And, and gone, and we will enjoy him forever. And we, ought, we should also, and, and, and this is because there is a somber note in his return, and that is the judgment. And because there is a somber note in his return, uh, we should you know, not only you know, live with a sense of expectantly, we should, we should live and share the gospel freely. Uh, the gospel ought to be, you know, if, if we really love those around us, they need to know about the hope they have in Christ Jesus and the mercy freely given, you know, because, you know, because of the cross. And then we should endure hardship, you know, patiently. And, and finally, you know, what you read in your passage, encourage each other with these words. We ought to encourage each other daily. You know, this week, uh, you know, Nancy Hood, who was a long time, you know, member of this church in last, you know, just posted on, 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 you know, Facebook, you know, 53rd, would have been our 53rd anniversary, how I miss him. And, and I wrote back to her, how we miss him too. And uh, I said, we were mourning with you as you mourn your loss. We're rejoicing with you in God's beautiful gift of a great, you know, life partner. And we also rejoice because we'll see that contagious grin again. All things, you know, will be restored in him. And so that's what we look forward to at his coming. Father, thank you for your goodness and for your grace. We thank you that the story ends so well for us. There's nothing that we deserve that's even close to the grace we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. It would have been enough if you'd forgiven us of our sins. It would have been enough... You know, if you've restored us, you know, to, to fellowship with you in the broken bodies, but you are giving us far more than our eyes could ever imagine seeing and our hearts could ever imagine longing for. And, and Father, may you enliven our hearts and set our imaginations on you. May we live well now, but may we live for the world to come. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Tree. 
his body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down and Joseph to the entrance by heavy stone Messiah still and all How great. 